Tony, you can go now. Can give him a big welcome. <laughs> Well, thank you for asking me. I want to start on Africa. You're experts on it, I'm not. But I've learned a lot about the world from my time in Africa. I was there for a year during the war in Zimbabwe. At that time, when it was a British colony, uh, after Cecil Rhodes went in, he stole the land from the Matabili and the Makrona, gave it to the white farmers. When I was there in the war, it was illegal for an African to have a skilled job, and of course the Pope. And that certainly makes me think that Britain is not a very good advisor to develop further democracy. But in the course of that, I became involved in the African, in the colonial liberation movement, and I'm honoured that I've met so many government people. Yep, I knew Ben Bella in the north, Swami Nkrum I met before he was Prime Minister and afterwards, and uh, all of them really I met. And uh, the great movement for the liberation of Africa was my main preoccupation, certainly for my first 20 years in Parliament, and of course I learned a lot from that, which helps me to understand what's going on now, because one of the things I learned was imperial powers do so many things, not only do they steal the resources, because Africa is a very rich continent with copper and oil and gold and so on, but also they deliberately destroy the history and the culture where they occupy it. And uh, one of the interesting me very much, when I was in Zimbabwe, I visited Zimbabwe, which is an African ruin. So we were told by the British High Commissioner that it couldn't have been built by Africans. It must have been built uh, by slave traders from Egypt, because no African could build such a building. And uh, the language was destroyed. The frontiers were drawn in Paris. That's why the frontiers in Africa are so artificial. Africa has always lectured on its wars, but they never mention the fact that Europe in the First World War killed 70 million people, in the Second World War 50 million. So talk about wars in Africa, 120 million people killed by Europeans in two world will never mention that. And I'd like to see an African peacekeeping force lecturing Bush on the need for peace in Iraq. That might be an interesting idea. And uh, so all these thoughts are in my mind uh, as I come to look at the new situation, because imperialism has a very simple way, it controls, it divides, and it tries to destroy, as far as it can, the culture of the country it's occupied. And of course that's happening in Iraq. It's not new in the Middle East, because after all the Middle East was the object of Western imperialism a long time ago. We occupied Egypt in 1882, and we didn't get out until 55, and we went back a year later in 56, because uh, NASA had nationalized the canal. Uh, we occupied Palestine after the collapse of the, of the Ottoman Empire. The French went to Syria. Uh, we were empowered Iraq, and indeed, uh, the British uh, in Iraq uh, used chemical weapons <coughs> against the tribesmen, uh, uh, using aircraft. And so the, the parallel is there. Now we see, of course, another example of it, the deliberate stimulation of conflict between the Sunnis and the Shiites and the Kurds. It's not an accident at all. It suits the United States perfectly, even though they've lost the war. But, you know, while even when they thought they were winning the war, that division weakened Iraq. And now with Palestine, uh, you have the incredible situation that with the um, uh, conflict, with the behavior of Israel towards the Palestinians, the Israelis are arming Fatah in Palestine to defeat Hamas, which won the election. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and Blair goes as a peacemaker. My God, I, I wish I was there. The day he went to Muslim leaders and said, I'm a peacemaker. I think it would be difficult for them to control the laughter. And so you can see it all happening in the same way. And the question is, how do you respond? Now, in view of our record, I always feel very modest in suggesting to Africa how the problems might be solved, because the new approach to Africa from the West is, of course, neocolonialism. Reference has been made to the multinational corporations. I saw Kenneth Cohen, who was another old friend of mine the other day, and he said when uh, uh, they had a debt problem, they came to and said, we'll lift the debt if you'll sell the schools and hospitals to multinational corporations. We lecture Africa on corruption. Well, look at British Airways and the planes in, in Saudi Arabia. Who are we to talk about that? And I think that, uh, that, that the whole approach of the West to Africa is a subtle form of recolonization through the control of the economy. Yes, mm -hmm. There was a man from, uh, oh, I forget, uh, probably the um, Adam Smith Institute, who said it would be better 
uh, if Africa was, uh, uh, was run by companies instead of governments, because it would be easier to get invested. <laughs> and uh, so you could just imagine an Africa company, we talked about the UAC, an Africa company taking over the prosperity for countries. And, and that's exactly what they really believe. And uh, therefore the whole democratic idea, which is intended to get control of the economy, is itself hostile to what they want to do. So always talk about democracy is a load of rubbish. Now the problem is how you deal with this without uh, further warfare, because I see in Colombo you've got an article about Northern Ireland, very, very interesting. Uh, and when Bobby Sands is referred to, you probably know the name of Bobby Sands. He was one of the IRA people who died in the hunger strike. And when he was in prison, he said something which I've always remembered. I've got a plaque on the wall with it on it. He said, our revenge, said Bobby Sands, will be the laughter of our children. And you work that one out. All we ask, said Bobby Sands before he died, that our children can laugh. Another example of the generosity of the African spirit to come back to me, uh, Mandela, when he was in the Robbins prison, said to the jailers, I'm the only free man in this prison. And you worked that one out. Mm -hmm. He was in prison, and they were imprisoning him, but when he said, you are prisoners of the system, I'm a free man. And of course, if you compare all the war crime stuff, which I was once in favor of, but I'm not anymore, but compare with Desmond Tutu's Truth and Reconciliation, I mean, the difference in terms of the tradition it leaves behind it. I was thinking, I met Saddam, as we probably know, a couple of times, and uh, when he was hanged, I thought, now, if uh, Mandela had insisted that forced to be hanged after the end of apartheid, mm -hmm. the bitterness would have gone on from that Absolutely. day to this. So, it's a funny thing to say for a European, but all the great moral leaders of my lifetime have been Asian and African, Gandhi, Mandela, Tutu. And it is uh, not one of them European, not one of them involved in big business, but they've given us an understanding how the process of social revolution and social change can be brought about.